House of Ed Tech, Episode 61. I am Patricia Brown from MissEdTechie.com, and you're listening to the House of Ed Tech with Chris Nessie. Support for this episode comes from Audible. So you like to listen to podcasts. Have you considered checking out audiobooks? Well, if so, Audible is the way to go because you can sign up for a 30-day free trial and get yourself two free audiobooks that are yours to keep no matter what. To get your free audiobooks, simply go to chrisnessy.com slash audible. Welcome to the House of Ed Tech podcast. I am your host, Christopher Nessie, and the House of Ed Tech explores how technology is changing the way teachers teach and the impact that technology is having in education. My objectives include discussing technology that is changing our classrooms and schools and sharing tools and tips that you can hear about today and use tomorrow. I talk to teachers, leaders, and creators just like you and have them share their stories. The purpose? Whether you use it or not, technology is changing the way we teach and how our students learn. And welcome back inside another episode of the House of Ed Tech podcast. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, happy generic time of the day, as the great Rob Walsh from Lipson likes to say. <laughs> so glad you're here. This is going to be a jam-packed episode. We have a full lineup. Got the EdTech thought, the EdTech recommendation, of course, the House of EdTech VIP, and my featured conversation for this episode with Miss Stephanie Hessline. But first, some feedback and a little news. So, for feedback, we, uh, we can get right to the old House of EdTech answering machine. You have one new message. Hello, Lindsay James here. I'm a special education teacher from Edison, New Jersey. Uh, first of all, your podcast is amazing because every time I listen, I leave an easy takeaway that I can go right into my classroom and use. I wanted to call in to let you know how much I absolutely loved using Edpuzzle today. I tried it out for the first time. Uh, I use LearnZillion, Khan Academy, YouTube, and Vimeo often. And I absolutely love the fact that I now have a central location to search for video content. This just made my life so much easier. I also love how easy it is to use. My history of sending a video for my students to just watch is probably now over. Now they can interact with the videos. If anything, at the very least, I can add a simple question to assess their knowledge of the topic before the video begins, and then revisit that same question at the end of the video to see just how much they've learned. I can also stop the video throughout and add multiple choice questions, open-ended response questions, voice notes. I mean, there are so many options. It's taking a video and making it interactive. Right now, I'm actually prepping my next video for a few groups for tomorrow, and I'm easily able to differentiate the questions for each group. Thank you so much for the advice. I'm definitely going to tune in tomorrow for another EdTech Takeaway. Have a great day. And you have a great day too, Lindsay. Thank you so much for sending in that audio feedback. First, Lindsay, you need to connect with Lindsay. She is on Twitter, of course, and her handle is LindsMJ. That's L-I-N-D-Z, the letter M and the letter J. He sent that audio feedback in via Voxer, which is super easy to do. And yeah, Ed, Ed Puzzle is awesome. I know you're also checking out Versal. And Lindsay got those recommendations from our last episode, which was episode 60, where I spoke with Jennifer Gonzalez, the author of The Teacher's Guide to Tech. If you haven't listened to that episode yet, or if you're new to the show, you want to go back and check out episode 60. And all the links that were shared and all the different resources can be found in the show notes for that episode, which is chrisnessy.com slash 60. And that's the number 60, 60, of course. And uh, Lindsay gets extra credit this week because not only did she send in some audio feedback about that show, but she also left an awesome and much appreciated iTunes review. And Lindsay said, quote, I listened to this podcast for specific takeaways that I can use in my classroom that day or the next day. Podcasts in general are sometimes stressful for me because there is a lot of busy talk and chit-chat. I love how this podcast stays on topic, gets to the point, gets you information quick, 
and give specific ideas. Love it. And I love the fact that you took the time to share that feedback and that review. And that means a lot to me, Lindsay. So thank you so much. And I'm going to get to meet Lindsay at EdTech NJ on June 4th, 2016. So I'm really looking forward to that. I'll be presenting there. And it's always nice to meet people who listen to the show. If you are also going to be at EdTech NJ on June 4th, uh, shoot me a tweet, shoot me an email, let me know. I would love to meet and talk to you if I haven't done that. Also want to say thank you to Jacob Dunn. He is at Jacob Dunn on Twitter, J-A-C-O-B-D-U-N-N. And this feedback comes in from Twitter where Jacob let me know that he learned he learns many interesting ways to use tech in his classroom and that I make it fun and to keep up the hard work. Thank you, Jacob. I will do my due diligence on the podcast for the the rest of time. I, I'm committed to this thing. <laughs> I've come this far. Why would I turn back now? And I'm certainly not going to quit. Uh, but thank you for your feedback. And uh, you were able to get that from me by using the hashtag House of Ed Tech. So thank you so much. Thank you to Sean Farnham at, and this has got to be the greatest Twitter handle ever, at Magic Pants Jones. And that's exactly how it sounds, Magic Pants Jones. Sean let me know on Twitter that he enjoyed the conversation that I had also with Jennifer Gonzalez, and he connected with her via Twitter, and I was in a bunch of tweets that went back and forth between them. So thank you, Sean, for letting me know that you listen to the show and that you enjoy it. I had the privilege of meeting Sean. I believe I met him for the first time at ISTE last summer. So Sean's a good guy. Of course, you know, like a free, these are all like free House of Ed Tech recommend uh, VIPs, uh, so, you know, make sure you connect with Lindsay and Jacob and also Sean. And just today, as I record this, the day before I release it, so I'm going to I'm gonna speak in today <laughs> rather than say yesterday. So uh, today on May 21st, I went to Tomorrow's Classrooms Today 2016, and I got to meet Angela Cleveland, who is uh, a new listener to the show. So I just wanted to give a shout out to Angela, and she is on Twitter. Her handle is at Angela Cleveland one, and that's A N G E L A C E L A N the number one. So Cleveland without the D, but with a number one. And she's a school counselor and anti-bullying specialist from New Jersey. And I was glad to meet her. And she came to my let's give him something to blab about session. So it was great to meet you, Angela. And I look forward to seeing you at future conferences. And since you're here in New Jersey, then it'd be easy. So thanks for checking out the podcast and I hope you stick around. Really appreciate it. Now, also, if anybody at any time ever has an ed tech question or you just want to share some thoughts, again, use the, use the hashtag house of ed tech, box me, Mr. Nessie, or you can call 732-903-4869. And I do want to also take a minute to thank my awesome supporters, Peggy George, Mark Grindel, Jeff Herb, and Dan Gallagher. They, uh, they are patrons, and they became awesome supporters by going to chrisnessy.com slash awesome. And without their contributions, a lot of what I do wouldn't be as easy as it is. So thank you for your, your support, guys. And if you want to become an awesome supporter, just go to chrisnessy.com slash awesome to learn more. And now, here's my ed tech thought. this episode, the EdTech Thought is titled, Get It Right the First Time. A lot of this comes from what just happened today at TCT where I got to hear Will Richardson do the keynote address. I heard Will once before back in 2007 as I was about to embark on basically my teaching career during my student teaching experience and the district I student taught in brought Will in to be basically the opening day speaker for all the teachers in the district, for all the schools. And it was really dynamic of a presentation for 2007. And I've been a fan and have been following Will for a long time. And one thing that came up in today's keynote was the idea of, you know, and more of a question, do we do wrong things more right? And why aren't we doing things right from the beginning? 
that really stuck with me because in education, we do a lot of things exactly that way. We we do things wrong and then we we're doing them the best we can, but a better choice could have been made right from the get go, whether it's hardware that we purchase or the way we design a lesson. There are just better ways and better things to think about. So some ways we can do that and really how we can eliminate these frustrations because it's a pain in the neck to do things that have to be corrected or, you know, maybe we did them not with full hundred percent effort. So maybe it takes a little more thought and a little more planning. Take a little more time to think of our students first. I've been saying for a while now that students are the biggest stakeholder and you probably agree with me that students are the most important part of education. You as a listener of this podcast are probably also of the mindset that they're the biggest stakeholder and we need to involve them and really think about their needs. But how do we do that? How do you do that? What do you do when your colleagues aren't putting students first? What do you do when your administrators aren't putting students first. You know, we hear all the time on Twitter through various sources, you know, kids matter. Do it for kids. Kids deserve it. And that's all true. But what are we doing to do that? I'd love to know. So this EdTech thought is me asking you some questions. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on what you're doing to do things right from the beginning. And if you have any stories about something you did wrong you did it the right way, like you did a a wrong thing right. I know it's very confusing. I'm confused. (laughs) Share it in the comments for the blog post, which would be over at chrisnessy.com slash 61. Send me your thoughts via Voxer. Call the hotline, 732-903-4869. I'd love to get your story. I want to include you. So if you have a minute or two minutes, let me know what you're doing to do things right from the beginning. That's my EdTech thought. And now for this episode's EdTech recommendation. Today I want to recommend to you MediaCore Capture. A lot of people are losing their minds about some screen capture tools that don't exist anymore, and they're upset that they can't do GIF files. And yes, it's a GIF like the peanut butter. Do the research. I did. The GIF. Go with GIF. If you disagree, let me know. I'd love to argue with you about it. (laughs) But let's stay on track. So MediaCore Capture. Uh, This comes from MediaCore Technologies, and this is a very simple Chrome extension that allows you to do screen captures and webcam recording. So you can easily create save, and share screencasts. I just found this this week, and Media Core Capture for Chrome is really powerful. Simple screen recording, simple screen capture that is compatible with your built-in mic, your built-in camera, or, as I did it here on the uh, House of Ed Tech supercomputer, with external cameras and also the fancy USB microphone. Uh, and it makes it really easy to create even higher quality screencasts and video recordings. Now, if you're missing the ability to do GIFs, I'm going to push you and challenge you to leave your comfort zone to actually make video. Put some stuff on YouTube. Put some stuff on Snapchat. Well, actually, this wouldn't work Snapchat, so that makes me sound like an idiot. But put some stuff on YouTube. Let's go that route. Uh, Media Core Capture is free to install. You can use it to record, save screencasts, and web recordings. You don't need a MediaCore account, so that's good because you can record it, and then you can download it right to your machine, do any editing, uh, or you can get it right to YouTube, and you can use the YouTube editor, and you can really put out some nice, high-quality screencasts. So you can record your screen. You could actually use it to even just capture video from the webcam. If you do a screen capture video, you don't even need to use the camera. You can just pick up the audio and not have to put your picture on the screen if that's not your thing. And that's totally cool if it is or it isn't. Uh, Media Capture is compatible with Google Chrome only because it's a Google Chrome extension. Uh, 
Windows PCs, Macs, Linux, and of course, Google Chromebooks. So check out Media Core Capture, and I will put a link to that in the show notes. In the Chrome web. That's my tech recommendation. And now for this episode's featured content, I had the privilege and honor of speaking with Stephanie Hessline from Middletown Township Public Schools. And this is a great conversation. I won't waste any time. So let's get right to my conversation with Miss Stephanie Hessline. Stephanie is a first grade teacher from Middletown Public Schools right here in New Jersey. She works in a one-to-one Chromebook classroom. She's also a Google for Education certified trainer and educator, and she is passionate about using educational technology to accelerate her students' learning. She is also one of the co-moderators of the hashtag NJED Twitter chat, and I first met Stephanie as a co-planner of the very first EdCamp Jersey Shore, which was held in August of 2015. Stephanie, welcome to the House of Ed Tech. Hi, Chris. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here. I am very excited to have you here because it is not often that I really bring on a guest or I myself take the time to talk about technology with elementary school students. So whenever I can do that, I need to take advantage. So thank you for being here. Awesome. Thank you. I'm excited. And specifically today, we're going to be talking about blogging in the elementary school classroom. And I think that's really interesting because you work with first graders who, I'll be honest, I didn't think you could get to blog. So I'm interested to learn how that works with first graders. Let's start with some of the benefits of getting young, young students blogging. And what does that look like? I really think that blogging is just such a powerful way to communicate as they grow and move through schooling and as an adult as well. So I just feel like to get these students blogging at such a young age and to be able to digitally communicate is really beneficial. I think that it gives the students a way to have like an authentic audience with their learning. So for example, like, especially the younger students, they have like a really small realm of people who get to share their ideas with and their learning with and the things that they're doing, especially with writing. And it might be limited to who's in the hallway seeing their stuff outside my classroom or their parents or maybe their grandparents. So I feel like blogging has given my students a way to share their learning more globally, and especially with the community members and people who wouldn't necessarily be in that close realm. When you talk about actual blogging, I blog, you blog, there are many people who have blogs, and the point is to express your ideas, and that's typically based on your experiences, based on what you're doing during the day and just your life experiences in general. What kind of topics do you have first graders who have limited life experience blogging about? Well, I do like to give them a choice, but we also use it to share like what we're doing in class. So sometimes I'll ask them to blog as like one of their centers. So I'll give them a prompt sometimes, but most of them, most of the time I just say, I want you to blog about something that you are interested in or something that happened this weekend or something that you want to share. A lot of the times they will um, write opinions on their books that they're reading in Reader's Workshop. So they kind of, it's kind of a mix of a choice, but also what we're doing throughout the day. Can you give us an example of a prompt that you've used recently? Um, Sure. I think a prompt that I used recently was, what is one thing they're excited about for spring break and what they're going to do in spring break and what that's going to look like? Now, speaking of of what that looks like, what is the length of a first grade blog post? Most of them are between a paragraph. Some of my higher students will write up to two paragraphs. I, I, I did not expect that. I know they really do. They surprise me. They, these kids work really hard. And so many times, like, I feel like with my whole classroom with these Chromebooks, it's always been like, I'm like setting the bar higher for them, which I feel like has really worked really well because they have met every single challenge that I do. I blog with them. I do genius hour with them. They use Google apps for education every single day. I don't know. Sometimes you need to raise the bar and not just look at them as first graders and really know your students and know that wait, they can do it and they can meet all these challenges and do all these great things. And we started, it's definitely a progression. Like I start with paper blogging first, where they'll actually like have a pretend blog and we'll go over what a blog is. And then they move from 
a paper blog to I'll have a class blog. And here they just all, all post prompts and questions and they will learn how to comment. And they're also learning kind of how to engage in digital conversation because they're replying to each other. And then from my class blog, then they created their individual blogs. So it's been a progression. What kind of reaction do you get from your students when you introduce this? Um, They were really excited about it. They were really excited to get to the individual blogs because I had shown them examples of what my fifth graders had done last year. And that's kind of, you know, who I started it with originally. And then when I moved down to first, I was like, they need to have blogs as well. And they were so excited that it was something that, you know, my fifth graders used to do. So I feel like they were just ready and willing to like get to that part where they could have their own blogs and share their, their ideas. Do you see a positive impact from getting the kids blogging in other areas of their academics in terms of like say language arts or how they interact with the other subjects you're teaching? Um, Absolutely. I feel like writing, especially they really have like developed like their own style because especially with blogging, they'll a lot of the times I'll have them publish their writer's workshop writing on the blog and they really make it their own. So I can tell like even their mindset, they're trying to have this audience be engaged in their blog. So they want to make it the best that they can. Like I said, it's a very authentic audience, but they also, I blog with like seventh graders from another middle school in Middletown Bayshore and fourth graders in Ocean Avenue school, which is another elementary school. And they, they get these comments from all their other peers that are blogging with them. And they want to make their writing the best that they can because they want these comments. So it also drives them a little bit to kind of push themselves in their writing. So it's been really great that way. It's one thing to actually implement this. What has the reaction been again, whether it's fifth grade or first grade when I guess you, at some point you have to talk to parents about this is what I'm going to have my students do. How does, how do moms and dads react to my students going to be blogging? Their concern is always safety first. And I do have, like my students' individual blog set up where it's not so much searchable. Number one, I go through so many digital citizenship lessons all year about like not using your last name and not giving away personal information. So they're really good that way. But I have like their URL set up that's like, it's like Middletown and then Fairview and then like their initials. So it's really hard to kind of find. So that was their biggest concern is security. But other than that, they've been so great. These parents comment every single time that they blog and they're interacting with their kids. And I've gotten really positive feedback about just being able to have that outlet to kind of see what they're doing and to be able to respond. And the kids love seeing their parents respond and they like commenting back. So it's been really positive. I can't say I've had any negativity about it. And I I could see one other positive aspect being this is a great way to even bring parents and kids closer together. Absolutely. And I feel like Again, we have a class Twitter as well. And then through blogging, I feel like they just have gotten such an outlook into our classroom that they wouldn't normally have gotten. Now, as we said at the top, you are a a Chromebook classroom. So you're using Blogger, I guess, right? I am using Blogger. You know what? I I went back and forth with the platform because, you know, everyone says like um, programs like Kid Blogger, like really kid friendly. And especially for first graders, I was like a little bit concerned but I just really modeled it for them. We went over the tools. I have the smart board. So like I'm able to like, you know, circle what buttons I need. And in the beginning, it was a little hard because Blogger is a little bit more sophisticated formatting than like Kid Blog, let's say. It was a challenge at first, but they really, as soon as a couple times and they got it and now they're, they're awesome and they're learning how to embed stuff now. Like we'll do stuff in our Google Drive and Google Slides and they'll embed it into their, into their blog. So they've gotten really good. And and they should and and those are great ways to uh, I don't know if that would necessarily be app smashing but absolutely and Genius Hour again like they're they're so excited about Genius Hour so blogging has been a great way to reflect that process as well like after they do their Genius Hour projects they do like a uh, Genius Hour update and they show pictures of what they're doing and it kind of lets you see the process of that as well like simultaneously so that has been one of my favorite parts as well as theirs <laughs> before we dive into Genius Hour. What are some of the tips and best practices that you can share with with my listeners who want to get their students to start blogging? Um, The first thing, obviously, choose a platform that works for you. Blogger has been so great, but you want to look at kind of your options and your grade level and you know your students and just be able to choose a platform first and start small. 
like I said, it's a progression. It's not something that you want to like jump right into without any digital citizenship or any lessons on how to blog and how to comment appropriately. So start small. I really recommend starting with a class blog. It's just been such a great way to really get them to practice and understand what blogging is before they kind of go right into their own individual blogs. Now, again, along the lines of tips and best practices, anything that you struggled with that maybe can help somebody avoid making a mistake in this process? I struggled with the student choice, especially for like my younger students. At first, they were really like, what do you mean I can write about anything I want? Like they were not used to that kind of thinking. They were used to like, what do you want me to write about? (laughs) So I feel like that was my hardest struggle. So I feel like it's okay. Like once in a while, if you want to give them a topic or if you want to give them a prompt, like let them get used to it first. And then the student choice part and what they want to blog about will naturally come. Well, I think that's going to be, that's a big shift that's going to happen in our society with, I mean, with the course that, uh, that I taught at Rutgers this semester, I gave students at the college level, a lot of leeway and a lot of choice to do what they wanted to do at certain points. Right. We're talking college age students struggling with, wait, you're not telling me exactly what to do. I'm not sure what to do now. Absolutely. It's a, it's a total different mind change. And it, especially for the younger kids, they're not used to it. Even adults aren't used to it. It's something that takes getting used to, but once they get it, it like comes so naturally once they're shifting and really thinking about, okay, I need to direct what I'm learning and I need to kind of think about what I want to learn about, what I want to say, what my thoughts and opinions are and go from there. Now with first graders developing that, that plays right into genius hour. Let's dive in. What does Genius Hour look like in your classroom? And how does the blogging move your students into that process? Well, Genius Hour has been really awesome for my classroom. We call it Firsty Genius because <laughs> I call my first graders Firsties, especially on Twitter. <laughs> uh, <laughs> just a fun little name. Genius Hour is something that, again, I was a little bit kind of concerned with because they were first graders and I had done it with my fifth graders, but like being able to adapt that just kind of was a little bit of a jump, but I decided to go for it. And we started off like, what is your passion? We watched the kid president video, which is such a great video for getting them kind of like pumped up. I explained what genius hour is in like kid friendly terms. The biggest thing that I had to teach them to do is how to research their, what they wanted to learn about and actually use tools that will help them research. So I did this thing called wonder Wednesdays. And it could be literally anything. And we, I taught them how to actually research at their level. So we used websites like KidRex, which is a great one, or Kittle, which is a visual search engine. So it gives them pictures. So some of them are still struggling with reading. So some of the words are a little bit hard. So the uh, visual search engine has really been great. And just every Wednesday, we would practice researching and kind of being able to pull information from websites and make it their own. And that's where the blocking came in. So from Wonder Wednesdays, then the second half of the year is when I started Genius Hour because it really took them a long time to be able to research and then again, think about what they wanted to learn about. So it wasn't something that I could just dive into in the beginning of the year, especially at the first grade level. So you have to learn that groundwork to develop research skills and then foster in them that inner desire to want to be inquisitive. Absolutely. So we, then we went to, what are you passionate about? And they, a lot of them were like my dog and art and science. So I had things all over the place. It was great. And it, what was, it was relevant to their life. And we came up with driving questions and they actually each made a little vlog of their driving question. So it was a little 20 second video about my driving question is this and a little example or a reason why they did, they wanted to learn what they're picked to learn about. So those came out so cute and we uh, embedded them on their blog so everyone could see. And then from there, they really started their project. And a lot of them, some of them were really self-directed and they dove right into it. And some of them did struggle and they didn't know where to go next. They have their research. They have like a plan of what they want to do for that day. And it ends up being really great to the point where they are completely self-sufficient now. Every Friday we do Genius Hour um, and then afterwards, they reflect on it via their blogs. That is so cool. Wish I was in first grade again. <laughs> Being in fifth grade and doing Genius Hour now at multiple grade levels, 
Can you share some of the topics that stand out to you that, that kids have shown their passion for and what they've done to, I guess, complete the project? Um, my fifth graders did a little bit different. They ha- I had a variation. I had one student who wanted to learn. Um, he was really passionate about his grandfather, who he loved, and his grandfather ended up having lung cancer. So he created a whole fundraiser online with a website and everything. And he ended up selling these little bracelets and it was really great. So he ended up making money for his grandfather, which was awesome. At the first grade level, I see a variety. I see a lot of coding. A lot of my class is very artistic. So it's how can you draw a realistic eye or how can I paint a watercolor beach scene or a couple of my students were really passionate about their their dogs because again, this is what's relevant to a first grader. So right. they did, how can I make a homemade dog toy or how can I make a photo album of my dog because she missed her dog when she's at school and that was her reasoning behind it. So it really is, it's relevant to what their life is. I, I don't know if I was dumb in the first grade. <laughs> it, it just seems like first grade has really changed since I was a first grade student. Uh, since I was a first grade student as well. I mean, they continue to impress me. Like I said, every day, sometimes I forget that they're fifth, fifth, uh, first graders. And a lot of times people say to me, like, do you, do you remember that you don't teach fifth grade anymore? And I'm like, yes, but they have met every challenge and they've been so awesome and so willing to dive right in. So, I mean, my, my fondest memories of first grade are learning how to write with a pencil and, you know, spelling tests on Fridays. That That's that's my big takeaway from first grade. I know. And you know what? It is important though to keep that balance. I will say that. Like it can't be everything technology and everything. I you do have to keep that you know the paper and pencil based a little bit and you have to keep like the arts and crafts that they love and it's kind of a blended first grade. No, that that's very positive. I just because you have technology doesn't mean you have to use it. You know, th- there's a time and a place. E- even though those Chromebooks are there, you know, they don't have to be out on the desk all day every day. Absolutely. I completely agree. Since you've moved grades once or, or a couple of times, at least you were know, in fifth grade, now you're in first grade. Yes. At any point this year, have you fantasized about maybe say in three or four years, switch grades again, and maybe you get some of these kids to see the growth or see what they can do when you, hit, when if you hit them again with some of these things? That would be amazing. I have absolutely thought about that because I feel like at this grade level, if they can do this, like I can't even imagine if they really continue and keep building on these skills, I can't imagine what they're going to be like in fourth and fifth grade and even middle school. Since you're not the only first grade teacher at your school, are the other first grade teachers doing similar activities? Um, They are. They are integrating it a little bit slower, but they absolutely are. They're willing, they're learning, you know, they're working with me as well. And my other first grade colleague has just started her students with blogging. So it's awesome. And they're going to start blogging together. So I feel like it's definitely, you know, becoming more standard. That is so great to hear. (laughs) Yep, it is. Slow, slowly, but surely it's coming. Slow and steady. That that's one of those first grade stories, right? Slow and steady wins the race. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. So some of the other things that I wanted to talk about with you and wanted to have you share with my listeners, again at the elementary school level, what are some of your favorite tech tools or websites or resources that you're using with your first graders? Um. Well, like I said before, <laughs> first and foremost, Google Apps for Education really has like been so instrumental in first grade because first graders just getting them to go somewhere like direct them where you want to go is like a challenge so google classroom is like so important everything is routed through google classroom so that's something that really has affected you know first graders especially with the chromebooks it's made my classroom so much more efficient um other apps that i like my students really like clip champ i talk about this all the time on twitter it's really great it's for chromebooks and it's a it's a super super easy. You don't even need a sign on, and it's to video yourself and Chrome on your Chromebooks, and it's free and it's awesome. And I recommend it to anyone who wants to make little videos. I think there might be a cap on it. I want to say five or ten minutes, but you can get a lot done in that time. Now, mentioning a tool like that, what are you having your students do with a video clip capture tool? Um, I use it a lot in Reader's Workshop, actually. 
So they'll make little book reviews. Um, they'll record themselves doing a book review or I'll use it to practice their fluency. So they'll read the They'll, they'll read the pages that they're supposed to be reading and they'll start reading it with feeling and then they get to watch it back to see kind of how they did and try and like read it even better the next time. I'll also I'll have them record their book clubs that they're in. So I just use it, you know, just to record whatever learning or to be able to express a, in a different medium what they're thinking about or learning about. Very cool. All right. What else is in your bag of tricks, Ms. Hesline? Um, let's see. Um, Teacher Monster to Read has been one of my favorite websites. My kids absolutely love it. They beg me to play it even at recess. It's a really great for primary grades, especially. Um, it's kind of a ne- really nice website that has kind of turned phonics and word recognition into like a really fun game with different levels. And they absolutely love it. So that's one of my favorites that I use in class. In full disclosure, the the other hidden reason, well, not hidden now because I'm going to say it out loud, that I want you to share these is because I've got a four-year-old, so I'm looking to get him ahead (laughs) for his second year of pre-K. But this, I I have feverish notes and I'll be using a lot of these, well, we'll use all these tools with Miles. That's funny. Another one is Video FX Live, which I use another recording. That's really for the iPads. Um, but it's really easy for them to use and they love it. They can do different filters on it. Um, it kind of is in place of like iMovie for the older kids. So okay. it's free as well if you get the live version, but you can do everything that you need to do in the free version. Like that. Yeah, absolutely. And ABC Ya yeah, and Dreambox, they're great for just having your students build on those reading and writing skills and math skills as well. Would you say that that's the primary goal of first grade. Absolutely. Reading, and- reading, especially reading and writing and math as well. But it's just first grade is one of those years that like they come in and they, they can't read and then they leave and they really, really have grown so much over the year and developed. And it's just one of those age levels. That's so amazing and rewarding to watch because Really, it's just one of those developmental years that they leave and you're like, wow, like you think back to where they started and you're just amazed. That's got to be something. I mean, I, I, I can't work at that level myself. <laughs> I mean, credit at people like yourself who, who do that. I would just play with the kids. <laughs> Sometimes it's it's tempting to do that because they're so cute and they're so funny and they say like the funniest things. They make me laugh all day long. But <laughs> That's, those are some tech tools that you use with your kids. What are some of your favorite tech tools, again, because this is House of Ed Tech, that make your life as a teacher easier? What are your go-to tools as the teacher? Um, well, again, I'm a Google girl, so I use Google for everything in my planning. Um, one of the most recent ones I've actually been playing around with is, um, I think you say Bunce. Do you know which one I'm talking about? Edu Buncey. I think it's Buncey. Oh, Buncey. Okay. So Buncey. I really have gotten kind of accustomed to it and I've been using it a little by little and I feel like it's really great as like another presentation tool and I'm trying to also now incorporate it with my students. So we'll see how that goes. Stay tuned for that. So I use Canva a lot. I'm a grad student as well. I'm almost done with my grad program and Canva has been so awesome for making graphics for that and also like newsletters, parent newsletters, because I'm doing a literacy program. So I will use that all the time to make really nice newsletters. And it's so easy and really user-friendly. And you do have to pay for some things. Like if you want certain photography, they'll charge you for that. But overall, the program's free. And it's been a great, great tool for graphics. And I use that for Twitter too, as well. Like if I'm doing promos for NJN or something like that. I was going to say you you are and and Marla Weinstein you you ladies are the queens of great graphics for Twitter chats. Yes, me and me and Marls, we're a good team. So speaking of NJ Ed, how did you get roped into that? NJ Ed, that was with actually Natalie Franzi kind of uh hooked us up with Billy Krakauer. She I was talking to her one day a couple years ago and I was like, "Nat, we should you know, start a Twitter chat. And she's like, well, she goes, I think NJ Ed could use some like some new life. So 
she kind of hooked us up with Billy, who was so great. And he kind of gave us the ropes and really let us, me and Marls kind of run with it. And it's been so great. Um, definitely tune in every other Tuesday and chat with us Tuesdays at eight. And you guys are doing a great job. So pat yourself on the back. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> now, coming up relatively quickly, I think it'll be just days from as this is being released. You are going to be at the Garden State Summit during Google for Education, which is going to be at Georgian Court University. What are you going to be doing, presenting? What are you going to be doing there? It is going to be a great, it's featuring Google for Education. I'm going to be there talking about blogging, actually. I'm, my, the name of my presentation is Can You Blog Like a First Grader? Definitely come check it out if you want to hear more and learn more about how to integrate blogging into the classroom. There's going to be tons of other great pre- uh, presentations going on. And Rich Kiker, who is awesome, he is kind of leading it along with Wendy Morales and Karen McConnell, who are also so great. So you should really go to the website and check out some of the presenters and see what interests you. It's going to be a really good day. What is the website for the Garden State Summit? It's just gardenstatesummit.com. Well, that's easy. Yep. Very easy to the point. <laughs> thank you so much for being here on the podcast. Chris, thank you so much for having me. This has been like my first real podcast experience, and I'm so glad that it was with the House of EdTech. Now, before I actually let you go, how can my listeners connect with you to learn more about blogging, Genius Hour? What are the best ways to get to you? Well, Twitter absolutely is the best way. Um, at Miss Hessline is my handle, as well as Google Plus, which is plus Stephanie Hessline. Either one of those, please connect with me and I would be happy to help you and answer questions and chat with you. And I will, uh, I, I will plug your blog for you, which is for the love of edu dot blogspot dot com. Is that still accurate? Absolutely. And that also routes any of your listeners to like my class blog and my students blog as well. So they can check that out for additional resources and examples. Very cool. Stephanie Hessline is her name. Again, first grade teacher, Google Chrome super user, has her kids and community doing some amazing things with blogging and genius hour. Please connect with her. She's at Miss Hessline. Check out her blog. Stephanie, thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Chris. And thank you again to Stephanie for being a part of this episode. And it was a great conversation. And I I am still, even, you know, a few weeks after having the conversation, still amazed at, at what she is helping her first graders to do and what her first graders are doing with blogs and blogging. I think it's, I think it's phenomenal. So if we can get first graders to blog, you know, there's no limit to what we can accomplish with our students in our classrooms today. Now, let's meet this episode's House of Ed Tech VIP. Congratulations to this episode's House of Ed Tech VIP, Miss Monica Burns. Monica Burns is an ed tech and curriculum consultant, Apple Distinguished Educator, and founder of ClassTechTips.com. In her role as a classroom teacher, she used iPads in a one-to-one setting with her students to create engaging, differentiated learning experiences. Monica has presented to teachers, administrators, and tech enthusiasts at numerous national and international conferences, including South by Southwest EDU, ISTE, and Edutech. She's a webinar host for Simple K-12 and a regular contributor to Edutopia and Channel One News. Monica is also the author of Deeper Learning with QR Codes and Augmented Reality, a scannable solution for your classroom, and that's from Corwin Press. Monica visits schools across the country to work with pre-K through 12th grade teachers to make technology integration an exciting and accessible experience. He also provides support to organizations using technology to reach children and families in need. If you're not connected with Monica, well, now's your chance. She's on Twitter. She is at Class Tech Tips, 
And be sure to check out Monica's website, classtechtips.com. Congratulations, Monica. You are a House of Ed Tech VIP. And that's going to do it for this episode of the House of Ed Tech. Thank you once again to this episode's supporter, Audible. You want to get two free audiobooks of your choice from a collection of over 180,000 of many topics and genres. Just go over to chrisnessy.com slash audible. And if you take advantage of that 30 day free trial, grab those two free audiobooks. You will be helping a podcast you love and enjoy. Keep the conversation going. Visit my website, grab the show notes, chrisnessy.com slash 61. And that is going to contain all the links. House of Ed Tech VIP, Monica Burns, a link to her website. Show notes are the place to be. And while you're there, drop a comment at the bottom of the blog post. We'd love to hear your thoughts on the EdTech thought. Remember, you have a little bit of homework. Want to hear your thoughts on that. And of course, outside of this episode, I love to connect with you. So find all the ways that you can connect going to the website and clicking share feedback. That's going to give you my email and all the different ways to connect with me. One of the fastest ways is Twitter at Mr. Nessie on Twitter. And you can just use the hashtag house of ed tech tweets related to the show. Connect with you there. I'm actually building a nice Twitter list of listeners to the show. So on Twitter, let me know that you listen to the podcast and I'll add you to this list and then I can keep up with what you're doing. You're taking the time to listen to me. I would love to connect and learn more from you specifically. Now, if you enjoy the podcast, and of course you do, you've gotten this far and you've listened to hopefully all 61 episodes now. If not, you can always go back. It's cool. It's timeless. Uh, Help me out. Here are three things you can do. Number one, tell somebody about the podcast. Word of mouth is the best way and the fastest way for you to share really any podcast you enjoy. So if it's this one or another podcast, tell somebody else about shows that you listen to. And if you want to tell somebody about mine, thank you in advance. Number two, go ahead and rate and review the podcast on iTunes. Your honest rating and positive review is going to help keep the podcast front and center for others to discover and enjoy. And you too can show your support through patreon.com. If you want to become an awesome supporter of the show, just go to chrisnessy.com slash awesome. On the next episode of the House of Ed Tech, I'm going to be recording it live at EdTech NJ in Edison, New Jersey on June 4th. Episode 62 is going to be released on June 5th, 2016. Until next time, thanks for joining. And remember, using technology isn't difficult, just give it a try. The House of Ed Tech is a proud member of the Education Podcast Network. The Education Podcast Network. Podcasts for educators. Podcasts by educators. For more, go to edupodcastnetwork.com.